Christina Chichitsky. I am one of the um, MPIs on the Chicago Czech Grant and one of the founding directors of the Center of Health at NEIU. Uh, Chicago Czech is providing funding and support for this conference. We're extremely excited to see so many individuals on Zoom. So welcome, good morning. And welcome to all of you who came to uh, join us in person. It means a lot. Thank you so much for coming. Um, without further delay, I'd like to go ahead and um, ask one of our uh, supporters of Chicago Czech and the Center of Health on Campus, Dr. Suda Sinivas, to uh, say a few words and take the microphone. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Siddharth Srinivas, and I'm an Associate Dean at the College of Arts and Sciences and a Professor of Physics here at NEIU. On behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences and Northeastern Illinois University, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this session of the fifth annual uh, conference of Women in STEM. It is very much a pride for the university that the annual Women in Science Conference brings us all together each year to highlight STEM research and teaching and to provide opportunities to engage our students in STEM. As a physicist and a woman in a STEM field, I feel particularly honored to be here to provide this welcome to you all today. This conference is a signature program for the college and the university, and each year it showcases the outstanding accomplishments of women in the sciences. Past conferences have highlighted the contributions of women in chemistry, in mathematics, physics, and biology. This year that tradition continues with the, conf the conference focusing on biological anthropology, and it continues to recognize and highlight the substantial contributions of some of the greatest minds in science, historical as well as current, and also helps nurture and inspire students, and in particular, more women students to seek a future in a STEM field. The annual uh, Women in Science Conference also points to the strong record that NEIU has uh, of supporting sciences in, at NEIU the strength of NEIU STEM curriculum, the, the high impact teaching practices at NEIU and the research of our STEM faculty. It also highlights the fact that our students get opportunities to work on research with faculty and have opportunities for mentorship and professional development in STEM. As Dr. Chichersky mentioned, the annual Women in Science Conference is sponsored and supported by the NEIU Center of Health and the Chicago Cancer Health Equity Collaborative, the Chicago Check, a significant partnership between NEIU, Northwestern University, and the University of Illinois at Chicago. It works on advancing cancer research, education, training, and community engagement. On behalf of the university the and the college community, I'd like to recognize the support and work of the Women in Science Conference Planning Committee, specifically the leadership of Dr. Tracy Lutke and Dr. Lisa Davis of the Anthropology Program, Dr. Lydia Phyllis, Chair of the Mathematics Program, and Dr. Christina Chichersky, Professor of Economics, for their stewardship of the annual Women in STEM conference series and the continued leadership of the NEIU Chicago Czech grant. I'd also take this opportunity to thank the many administrative staff that work tirelessly to make each year's conference a success as they have on this one. With that said, I hope you enjoy today's talk by Dr. Jill Preetz, a world-renowned anthropologist. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Davis, Chair of Anthropology, and I want to welcome you also. Uh, we are waiting for a short welcome by the president, but I didn't want to hold things up. We'll go ahead, and I just want to let you know my introduction may be interrupted if she, if she comes in. But I know you're not here to listen to us. You're here to listen to our, our esteemed speaker today. Um, so I want to welcome the audience in the room and also those joining us remotely. For those of you online who are joining us remotely, if you have questions, um, you can pose them in the Q&A and uh, you can be assured that we will see them and ask them at the end. So we set up this webinar for, uh, to bring you into the room as much as we can. And so do not hesitate to, to post questions or comments. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Jill Preetz is a primatologist who works on chimpanzee feeding ecology and tool use. She earned two bachelor's degrees at Texas State University, one in anthropology and one in sociology. And she received her PhD in anthropology at University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. After many years in a tenured position in anthropology at Iowa State University, Dr. Preetz moved back to Texas State University where she is currently professor of anthropology. Dr. Preetz's research focuses on chimpanzee behavioral ecology and conservation, and she has maintained a long-term field site in Fongoli, Senegal. Her work is highly regarded for providing both valuable data on chimpanzee behavior in, a, in an unusual savanna environment, and also for her community conservation organization called Neighbor Ape, which supports chimpanzees and their human neighbors in Fongoli. Dr. Preetz's research has, re has revealed some truly incredible behaviors not seen before in chimpanzees and has implications for how we think about ape cognition, tool use, and innovation. It also has some, some exciting implications for early human evolution, which played out in an environment not unlike Fongoli. Dr. Preetz has a prolific publication record spanning more than 30 years in multiple captive and wild species and on the topics of predation, tool use, hunting, community-based conservation, feeding ecology, captive enrichment, reproductive biology, chimpanzee archaeology, and much more. She has published a children's book called You Can Be a Primatologist with the National Geographic Kids series and has a contract um, for a book on the Fongoli chimps with the University of Chicago Press that she is uh, working on. Dr. Preetz serves on numerous boards of research, conservation, and sanctuary organizations and has earned a very wide range of awards uh, for both her scholarship and her teaching. Her work is also featured on no less than seven films that have been produced by National Geographic and the BBC. One of the most recent is the BBC Dynasties series, which you may have, have seen. And uh, her work is, uh, will also be featured on a new series in, on Netflix that will be coming out. So keep an eye out for that. I'm not done yet, but I'll, I'll stop here <laughs> and, and present to you um, Dr. Jill Preetz. Hello, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, series of introductions. Um, it's really great to be back giving a talk, at least partially in person, for the first time in two years. I was so excited and flattered to be invited to, to speak to this group. Um, so I will be talking about the chimps that I study, and I'll focus on some of the unique behaviors and discoveries that come out of this site as well as um, talking more about what the future of the chimps is like or what we anticipate may happen because of things like climate change, uh, increased human activity, et cetera. And I'll end up with uh, a brief discussion of my nonprofit organization that works with the people that live alongside the chimps because without those people, these chimps would not be there essentially and so um, I also have a number of videos that I, I think you'll enjoy. Hopefully um, I won't mess those up and you'll be able to see the chimps because I think that it's, uh, it speaks, 
they, they speak to their behaviors a lot better than I do in terms of explaining them. So first of all, I just wanna give you an idea of where my site is. And so this is a map um, that was published in a National Geographic magazine some time ago, but what it shows is the major research sites, at least most of them, in terms of long-term chimpanzee studies. So you may be familiar with that lady at the top, that is Jane Goodall with a chimpanzee early in her career, and she initiated the Gombe National Park study um, over 60 years ago now. And at Mahali, also in Tanzania, you have studies that have been going on for almost that length of time. There are a number of sites you could add in in Uganda, for example, but my specific site is way over here to the west at Fongoli. And <clears throat> there are a couple of, of things I, I point out about my site. One is that it's in West Africa and there are different chimpanzee subspecies. And we do see some differences in behavior. And so based on what we've studied so far when it comes to chimpanzees, we have a real heavy bias towards the East African subspecies. In fact, there are more long-term study sites in Uganda, even though they're not all on the map, than there are in the rest of Africa, um, which is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. But it does mean that you, the West African species, for example, is underrepresented. And right now there are only three long-term study sites of West African chimpanzees at Fongoli, Basu, and Guinea and Thai and uh, Ivory Coast. And we have some chimpanzees that have been rarely studied like the Central African chimpanzees um, represented here by the Gulugu Triangle site. But another difference between the chimps that I study and chimps, uh, for example, in East Africa, and really the reason why I focused on the Fongoli chimps is that it's in a savanna habitat. So that's what drew me to study chimps here. I actually studied monkeys in Kenya for my dissertation work. I knew I always wanted to get back to study chimpanzees. I had worked with them in captivity. Um, but once I studied in Kenya in this amazing savanna habitat, I knew that I wanted to, to partner my interest in chimpanzees with feeding ecology, behavioral ecology studies in a savanna habitat. And up until at that point, chimps had not been habituated to humans in such a habitat. So there was a lot of skepticism as to whether or not it could be done, whether or not you could get these chimps used to an observer to the point where you, you would follow them from dawn to dusk, which is how we study chimpanzees and other primates as well. But being a stubborn person, I knew I could do it. And um, I got some very important grants uh, at the beginning, National Geographic, I always owe them a lot. Primate Conservation Inc. also gave me some money to go out and just see if it was a feasible site. It turns out um, it was. And so I started now coming up on 21 years ago, the Fongoli um, research site. And that's my camp. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a, a station, but it's my camp. Um, and another, so you can see the open habitat, maybe to you that's not a very chimpy site uh, or habitat, because if you've seen chimpanzee documentaries and they didn't have Fongoli chimps in them, you probably saw forested uh, habitats like Gombe and places like Kubali and, and Uganda, et cetera. But this is a very typical shot up from a drone of the Fongoli study site. And another thing that is, uh, I think, not unique, but rare is that this particular long-term study is situated outside of a national park. So it's in an area where chimps have lived alongside people, I say for millennia. And so people are a part of their, their ecosystem. And the people here practice shifting horticulture and agriculture. The chimps um, are used to living alongside these people and the people's cultural uh, beliefs and taboos against eating chimpanzees is one of the reasons you still find chimpanzees in this area. So, um, not only that, but it's, it was instrumental for me to have uh, permission and help from the local community in establishing my study. And of course they thought I was odd to say the least when I, I came and started asking them about chimpanzees and trying to follow them from day to day. But uh, five years later we were, uh, and I can, I can, when we get to the question and answer period, I can talk a lot more about that process of habituating chimpanzees, starting the project, et cetera. But we're now able to follow chimpanzees from dawn to dusk daily. And so these are a few shots of their habitat um, rear view there. 
of chimpanzees during the rainy season. <clears throat> so it is a, a very different habitat in terms of the type of vegetation they're exposed to. They do always range in areas that have trees. The trees are not these very tall tropical forest, uh, rainforest type trees, or even wet forest type trees are pretty low. Um, they're scattered, so they move on the ground when they travel. They don't really move from tree to tree within the canopy like they can do at more forested sites. And you have these open grassland areas, and that's what you're seeing here in part. And so they, they move long distances on the ground. One other thing about the site is that it is the hottest place where chimpanzees have been studied to date. And that was really what I was interested in is stresses like heat. And as Dr. Davis said, this is the type of environment we think that perhaps our earliest human relatives um, evolved in. And it's one of the reasons that I study chimpanzees here. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, I, and on one level, it's a natural history study because there was basically very little known about chimpanzees in a savanna landscape, except from studies of unhabituated chimpanzees, but there's only so much you can do. Um, once we were able to start following the chimpanzees, we discovered a number of behaviors that just weren't possible to record otherwise. And so a really broad question is, how do these chimps in the savanna differ from chimps living in a forested environment? This is a type of what we call a referential model. So it's looking at different um, stresses like heat, et cetera. And so I, I didn't give you specifics on heat, but just to give you an example, um, right now it's towards the end of the dry season and it's uh, anywhere from 106 to 110 degrees. April is hotter. Um, when we go in May, it's when I take students and knock on wood, we're going this May. Uh, the heat has not yet diminished, but the rainy season is starting to threaten. So what you have is high heat and high humidity. So the heat index is usually over 120. So that is, for us, it's very hot. Um, for the chimps, it's also hot, but they've learned or they've come up with different ways to deal with that. So that's one of the things I'll focus on today because that was really something we had not seen um, at other sites because of the lack of that kind of stress. And so water stress, for example, is something they have to deal with a lot. And I you know, went out with these uh, different ideas about what I was gonna study. And I definitely still continue to study feeding ecology, et cetera. But then the chimps continue to do these, be, you know, exhibit these behaviors that are either unique or really rare elsewhere. So their behavior has really guided my studies over the past two decades, which is super fun. Um, they do things I would never have predicted like hunting with tools. And so I'll, I'll spend you know, a large proportion of today's lecture talking about hunting with tools. And it's something that we continue to study, but I never would have predicted that among other things. And so, you know, basically I owe everything to the chimps uh, as well as the people of Senegal <clears throat> for allowing me to, to come in there. But uh, this is just, you know, I've got, I've chosen a number of images that I hope give you an idea of what the habitat is like. This is another of this open grassland with the shrubland in the background. This is an adult male with an adult female behind him. Um, their home range is larger than chimpanzees' home ranges elsewhere. So around over a hundred kilometers that varies according to season. And it is a community that's on the small side as far as chimpanzees go. So usually on average 32 chimpanzees, I think we have 31 right now. We just had a birth in January. And um, interestingly, a larger number of males than females. And so that's something I have to take into account. So you don't see that at other sites and I have different ideas as to why that might be, but that's something that may affect their behavior. And I'll, I'll circle back to that in a second, but I'm gonna go ahead and get to some chimpanzee behavior. Um, so I have, like I said, different studies that focus on tool use. And um, there are, are uh, different ideas as to what tool use is. As anthropologists, we've been interested in a long time. Once upon a time, we used uh, that to define our own species that we make and use tools. And now we know a lot of different animals do that. And um, it, after we discovered the, uh, the fungal age chimpanzees, uh, hunting with tools, we also, you know, basically caused uh, anthropologists to redefine a little bit our definition of hominins as well. But I'm going to show you some different videos of different types of tool use and what some people call proto tool use at my site. And then I'll talk more about the, the hunting. So this is an older female, we call her Nene. 
the common Senegalese name. And she's using a stone anvil to break open a hard baobab fruit, one of their top sources of food, especially during the dry season. This is a food that juveniles cannot get into and they're forced to beg for food their mothers often share with them. But we also see adult males, for example, sharing with young chimpanzees and that's not something you see at, at many other sites. They don't use sto uh, hammer stones like chimpanzees do elsewhere in Africa and West Africa at least. Um, I'll apologize for the camera work in my lecture, that's all me. Uh, I thought he was gonna do something there. So that's one type of tool use. Um, there are some other types of tool use that involve what you may think of as defense or offense, but it's against predators. So this doesn't show tool use, but this shows an image of a beautiful leopard that um, uses the same caves that the chimpanzees use. Her, uh, the cave she's using close to this water source right now is one that the chimpanzees often use to rest in. I'll come back, you'll see images of that cave. And I didn't see this video until I was in Costa Rica teaching a class and I had downloaded all my camera trap images, hoping to get a look at a male that had disappeared from our group. And I saw a leopard on the, the camera trap image. So immediately I was sent a message to the, the men that worked for me in Senegal and said, hey, watch out, there's a leopard that's, live, that's around Sokoto is what we call this particular area. And right on the other side of that water source you see is where our trail goes, or at least where it did go. And we, you know, we set out after the chimps before it gets light and then we come home after dark. And so we moved our, shifted our trail out from, from that area. Um, but one of my field assistants did observe the chimpanzees, uh, we think it's that same female leopard, find that leopard in a, in a different small cave and they use these large branch tools to basically harass her out since she finally fled the cave. And, he wasn't sure what was going on, but what was really interesting about that as well, it was the two older chimps that exhibited this behavior. And so these, they found dead branches on the ground that were um, around five feet long. We, we kept one of them and they were just stabbing it into this cave and all the chimps were around giving warning barks, but it was really these two old individuals that we call Bandit and Frafa. And Frafa is a female that's now probably in her 50s. And she actually had a baby hanging onto her at the time. And they kept stabbing it in at what was uh, then seen to be a leopard. But my field assistant didn't know what it was. And at one point, I guess the leopard started to charge out. The chimpanzees all screamed and they ran up a tree. And he was standing there, you know, going, oh my gosh, I hope it's not a lion. <clears throat> and then it turned out it was a leopard. Finally, they harassed that leopard so much it, it fled that area. And it was an area that also includes an important water source. And so that's something I didn't mention, but even though the, the site is predominantly woodland and grassland, you do have these tiny patches of forest. And that's an image here of one of those, or at least the edge of one of these patches of forest, about 3% of that range only, but those are, are key. Without those tiny patches of forest, the chimps couldn't survive in this area. And they really are at the edge of the species range. They don't, you don't find chimpanzees much farther north in Senegal, some, some distance north, but they really are restricted by these tiny patches of forest that um, is also where you find these water sources. So I'll talk more about water in a second. Um, I have got another video here. And again, I apologize for the camera work. It's me. So this is a male chimpanzee throwing a stone at a snake. I thought he was done. So I had backed off and he comes back up to throw more stones. Um, this is a rock python that a young uh, female chimpanzee had found. And chimps, like other primates, have very distinct warning calls for different types of predators or danger. And so um, even if you've spent very little time around the chimps, you can quickly learn what a snake alarm call is. And we uh, actually working up a paper on it right now because they encounter dangerous snakes quite a bit. And so one of the differences we found is that they are more reactive towards snakes and trees. And the other thing is that, so that chimp there that threw the stone is a male that we call Dawson and Dawson and another male are especially reactive and adolescent males are also very reactive. They almost always use some weapon against uh, snakes. And so in addition to rock pythons, which can be a predator, you have some snakes that are venomous and dangerous like puff adders, several other vipers um, mambas, uh, cobras, a couple of different cobras. So you have a lot of different dangerous snakes at the site. Um, and what's interesting as well is that when they detect a snake 
everybody in the group has to come by and look at it and then leave. And so anyway, I can talk more about that as well. Um, really fascinating. But so you do have these examples. There's a lot of stone throwing at my site. At some forest sites, you don't have stones. So they do use stones in defense. They'll use them against baboons, <clears throat> um, against cows sometimes, uh, and against each other. But they, they definitely um, use stones and sticks as well against dangerous animals like, like um, snakes and spotted hyenas. We've also seen stone throwing at spotted hyenas. So this is another example of till use. This is the classic example of termite fishing. This is the old female frappa, the one I told you that um, use this big branch to basically rouse a leopard from a cave. And so she's exhibiting termite fishing behavior. And that's not seen at all chimpanzee study sites, but at many. And at Fongoli, termites are one of their top three foods. And they feed on termites throughout the year, even during the dry season, when at other sites, they may not feed on them during the dry season. Um, I've had numerous students study this and it appears to be a food, it's a very high quality food, but it's also one that takes uh, little energy. You can sit there and believe me, they will sit there for hours and hours. And when you first see termite fishing, you're very excited. Oh, Jane Goodall, termite fishing, et cetera. And then three hours later, it's like, oh my goodness, are they ever gonna stop termite fishing? And literally into the night during the dry season, I'll talk about this. I'm spoiling some things, but you know, they also uh, will stay awake later at night at this site because it's just so hot during the day. And so they'll literally be eating termites for two hours after dark. And all you can do is sit there and hear them crunch the termites. And uh, yeah, you quickly get tired of termite fishing. Never thought I would say that. But this is the behavior that is unique to the site. It's a behavior that's literally only been seen a handful of times. In fact, I think three times at other sites. And that is using tools to hunt other animals. But they do it systematically at Fungoli every year. I will say that they do hunt this adorable little primate called a bush baby or a galago. And this is a primate that's nocturnal, it's very small. And during the night, it's active. Um, during the day, it's trying to sleep peacefully in a tree cavity like the one you see Ava jabbing her tool into. Um, and so this is something that was first described in 2005 and we see it every year. It's something we now have a long-term uh, you know, record of. And it's, it's, there's still a lot that I'm interested in specifically you see. So this is a chimp Ava and that's her daughter Tessa hanging there watching her. And so one of the things I'm studying right now is how they learn the behavior. Um, you know, our offspring of successful hunters, good hunters themselves, that sort of thing. So I do wanna talk more about the hunting with tools. And I will tell you, I don't think I have any images, any graphic images of bush babies being uh, captured. I, I have a lot of guilt when it comes to bush babies. There's, I even used just a drawing of one there to make it look less cute. <clears throat> but um, yeah, and they're adorable. Uh, they, so the, the, the chimpanzees uh, have a very discreet and standardized, I guess I, I say standardized, way of making the tools that they hunt with. So in over 500 cases, we've only seen them reuse old tools uh, twice. They may use a tool someone just abandoned, but they almost always get a green branch, break the branch off, break the leaves off, trim the end of it, et cetera. And then you have some individuals that do trim the tip of the tool with their teeth. And then certain individuals that will take all the bark off the tool. And I thought that was a little bit of overkill until one of the film crews asked me to exhibit the behavior myself. And when the bark is stripped off of the tool, it makes it a lot easier to jab into a cavity that has all kinds of protuberances inside it, et cetera. And so this is a very, you know, stylized process. Um, and then at the top there, you see the tip of one of the tools that's been trimmed with the teeth. And then you see just kind of a bunch of tools that I've, I've deposited on the ground in front of my hut at Fungoli. And that's, I think represents a season's worth of bush baby tools. They can vary in length, but they're usually around 70 centimeters in length. That's the average, I believe. Um, and uh, we do, you know, uh, do a number of different studies. I work with an archeologist at Texas State right now and to look at different aspects of the tools. They have preferences over certain species of trees. And I will say one of the things, as I mentioned that we're studying right now is how the process is learned um, 
and one of the things I find really interesting is at, at Fongoli, infant chimpanzees are not weaned until they're around four. That's actually quite early compared to chimpanzees elsewhere. But an infant that's two years old can go through that whole process and make a tool. But the thing is, they'll have this little bitty tool that's about the length of a pencil, literally, and they'll use it you know, very earnestly, but it's just a really poor tool. It's a baby tool. Then when they get to be around four, four to six, they start making tools of different lengths. Sometimes they're inappropriately long where you can't even get it into the, the cavity. Other times it's made of a vine that doesn't work, you know, something like that. But they start to appear to learn the tool properties. And then when they get to be adolescents and adults, they basically don't change their behavior too much. Um, but it's really interesting to me to see that this little baby can make a tool just like that, but it's a tiny baby. You know, I've got a number of baby tools actually that are very cute, but very ineffective so far. Um, so that's one of the things that we're working on currently. So um, I haven't uh, analyzed data recently. I actually wasn't able to go to Senegal for 18 months during COVID, but data collection continued. Um, so this would be you know, the, the data I'm giving you. We would have well over 500 hunts at this point. Um, one of the other things that's really interesting about this behavior is not only do they hunt with tools, <clears throat> it's the females that hunt relatively more than males. And if you look at chimps elsewhere, that's not the case. Males are the hunters in the group. It's another area that anthropologists have been study have been interested in for a very long time, um, and you know where chimpanzees have been used as models to try to understand the evolution of hunting behavior in humans. Um, but what we see here is that based on a number of different factors, females are more likely to hunt with tools than males. <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But basically, it's an activity they can exhibit when they have a dependent infant hanging on. It's not that females don't capture monkeys, they can, and I'll show you. I do have a couple of graphs that I'll show you that give you the top hunters in the Fongoli group, but there's more to it than that. Um, there are other sites as well in Africa where females hunt, but I think what's key, I'll go ahead and spoil it, what's key here is that what happens after the hunt. And so what you see at Fongoli is that you don't have theft. In East Africa, for example, where chimpanzees have been studied and a female or a low ranking male captures a monkey is what they, they, they hunt the most. The dominant male, especially the alpha, a dominant male, especially the alpha will take that prey from them. And there's usually meat sharing. But the fact is, you know, my hypothesis is that why would you continue to hunt in a group with males if you're gonna have that prey taken from you? And at Fongoli, we don't see theft, I think. Um, we've seen literally definitely less than 10 thefts um, over the past couple of decades. And uh, I think it was only two individuals. And so there's incentive to hunt if you, you know, get to actually keep your prey. And I, I will come back to that in a minute, but I had to go ahead and tell you the name. I'm going to let this, uh, there's a narrator here that talks about the chimps. I think it's BBC. So I'm going to let the BBC narrator go ahead and narrate this particular film clip for you. And it's of a it's of two chimpanzees hunting. I'll just tell you there's that's Farafa. She's that older female that I've mentioned before. She's a very successful hunter. And then there's Jumkin. He's currently the alpha male. So during the day when their prey hide in hollow trees, the chimps use sharpened sticks to catch them. The best hunters continually modify their weapon to suit the shape and depth of the hole. The male has a less refined technique. His spear isn't even straight. It's a huge contrast with the considered expertise of the female. The male favors brute force. When the stick breaks, he even tries to scare it out. Fortunately, the youngsters generally learn from their mother. But the male perseveres, and this time he's made a bit more effort with his spear. It's just a shame he didn't make it shorter.
There's little for a young one to learn here. For the youngsters, just making a stick is an achievement. Making one long and strong enough is even harder. It's both technically complicated and hugely frustrating. Even for the experts, there are no guarantees of success. The bush baby squeezes out and in a flash, it's gone. But there is one bush baby that Okay. <laughs> I always feel a little guilty about that clip because poor Junkin, he just looks so hapless and he's the current alpha male. I, I will say that I feel like they caught him on a bad day, but there are definitely cases. There was a, there's another male, Bilbo, adult male, and he also has, his technique is poor. But, uh, you know, technically, when you look at the success rate of males and females, um, they are equally successful. But yeah, it's, it's just, it's very interesting. And that's one of the things we're working on too. Now we have a sample size, I think, that's large enough to let us look at individual behavior. And so we know, for example, Frafa, the old female shown here, she is a very successful hunter. I'll show you that in a graph. And then the current alpha female, Tumbo. And then um, you saw her daughter, that's Vivian. Uh, you know, exhibit the behavior. And she had this skinny little tool that, that wasn't going to work, but she ultimately um, grew up to be quite an accomplished hunter on her own. The thing about chimpanzees is when females get to be adolescents, they leave their, their natal group, the group into which they're born. And so these young females usually leave their, their natal group. So I do have uh, just a few graphs um, and, and basically it is that females hunt more than expected. And specifically it's adolescent females, at least in the last analysis, ad adolescent females that drive this. And one hypothesis I have is that when you look at meat sharing, and again at chimpanzee study sites where they hunt and they do at most chimpanzee study sites, they share meat. And so that's also of great interest to anthropologists. A lot of other foods are not shared. At Fungolia it is, but that's a whole nother subject. Um, and so when you look at patterns of meat sharing, adolescent females are not likely to, to get a share. And so it, it, you know, one hypothesis I have is that this is basically the only way they can get access to meat. And even though meat accounts for a very small percentage of the diet, less than 5%, it's a very prized uh, resource. And so adolescent females are really driving that difference. And then I want to just say, you know, uh, summarize a little bit. It's, it's, it's definitely interesting to me that females hunt quite a bit at Fungoli. And I'm sorry, I do have a bush baby shown at the top. I forgot, hopefully you can't see it too well. That is uh, alpha female Tumbo with a bush baby. She's the first chimpanzee that we observed actually get a bush baby prey. And it was Paco Bertolani was my project manager at the time observed this. And um, so she is one of the, the top hunters and not only are females, uh, like I said, females are, are, are seen hunting at the site, but you have these low ranking males. And to me, that's interesting as well. And so up at the upper left, you have an adult male, Sibrut. He's the oldest male. He's the lowest ranking right now. He's number 10 out of 10 in the dominance hierarchy. And he is the most successful hunter in the group. And um, he's also one that you would expect to see uh, theft occur when he when he captures a prey item if he was at a site in Tanzania you would expect to have someone steal that from him but we don't see that at Fungoli so again it's there's aspects of the social group that allow this this behavior to uh, emerge at this particular site and it actually does tie into the environment in various ways which I can talk more about um, later as well. So I just have a couple more graphs. It's really just to, to show these top 10 hunters and the stars indicate females. So at most sites, you wouldn't see females included in this list of top hunters. And I've included various colors to show you what types of uh, prey items they, they focus on. And so another thing about Fungoli is that the Galago or bush baby prey is the type of animal that they're hunting the most. I will say that at this site, <clears throat> what you see is that, um, Monkeys are especially bad crop raiders. Fortunately, the chimps do not raid crops. So monkeys 
are hunted by people because of that reason. Um, so you don't see high densities of monkeys here. Also, you don't have the red colobus monkey at Fongoli and at other chimpanzee sites, that's the preferred prey item, but it's too dry for red colobus to survive at Fongoli. It's just not their environment. And so they eat things like Galagos, uh, vervet or green monkeys, more accurately baboons, uh, patas monkeys, <clears throat> which are my absolute favorite monkey. It's what I did my dissertation on. So I'm very torn when I see that, but fortunately that's rare and then bushbuck fawns. And so the, the types of prey items that fungally chimps um, focus on are different from chimpanzees that live in forests as well. So this is a, a slide that just really shows you the top 10 hunters. And so Sibrut there, that's the old dude. He's at number one. Then there's an alpha male, David, he's no longer with us. Um, and Lupin was an alpha male, et cetera. But you see Tumbo and Farafa, they're included. So this is a graph that's just a little bit of a twist on that. It's the same individuals, but looking at the type of prey that they capture, this is how much meat is acquired. And uh, we looked at it this way because we're interested in meat sharing. And so uh, a student from Texas A&M just successfully defended her dissertation and she looked at meat sharing by the Fungoli chimpanzees. And, um, and so that, sh that should be published pretty soon in various forms. But one thing that we were really interested in is seeing how females share meat because at other sites, again, it's the males that, that have access to the prey. You don't really see females having a chance. And so even with something like a Galago, which I compared to a taco. So are you more likely to share a pizza or a taco, right? And I, again, apologies to Galago people, but uh, you, know, you can easily eat a taco yourself while walking to the TV, I don't know. But uh, you still see sharing of your taco by females. And so that was something we're, we were really interested in is seeing how females share. And as you would expect, they share with their offspring, but there are some other interesting um, dynamics as well. So she just, just defended that. And I was really happy to have someone look at that data set. So um, just to kind of sum up about the hunting behavior, there are different explanations. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked about basically what I think about the fact that females uh, are allowed to keep their prey as well as these low ranking males. And so there's incentive to hunt. And we have, you know, found some interesting patterns about meat sharing behavior. And it is something that um, I, I I find informative for trying to understand about the evolution of hunting behavior and hominins. Uh, hunting in early human evolution. And um, one thing that there's an archaeologist at Wisconsin Madison, Travis Pickering, published a book, I believe it's called Rough and Tumble. And he talks about the fact that this type of hunting is uh, significant because it removes the hunter from the prey to some degree. And whereas when you see a monkey hunt by chimpanzees, it's a very different type of behavior. It can be considered aggressive, of course, on the monkey side, it definitely is. Um, so it's just a different type of behavior in it, and he finds it useful, which I appreciate. Uh, but I think I'm gonna move on. Uh, well, just one more slide about hunting. But I, so like I said, I think that, you know, the fact that you have sort of a different type of social group uh, definitely uh, affects the, the behavior, and I can talk more about that. But basically the Fongoli chimps are very cohesive as they move around their, their environment. And um, chimpanzees have a fission fusion organization where you rarely find all the chimpanzees in a single group together. And that's just not the case at Fungoli. In fact, it's the opposite. There are definitely times when they, they uh, break apart into small groups. So much of the year you find them together as a social group. And so that top individual eating that vervet monkey uh, is a former alpha male, David. So he was featured in the dynasties documentary and he was a very aggressive alpha and he was one of the only two individuals I believe that actually stole prey items from other individuals but again really rarely and when it happened the whole group would go after him to the point where they uh, one of the them that I witnessed is he was chased to the extent that he eventually dropped the prey item and so he wasn't able to keep it for himself um, and so there's there's um, you know social aspects of this behavior definitely and then I always have to take, just to jump to the bottom, the fact that we have a skewed sex ratio. So you might see it, some might say it's a form of male mating strategy to be tolerant of uh, female chimpanzees. You don't always see that, especially in East African chimps, but it doesn't quite work for the explanation of why low ranking males would also be allowed to keep their prey. Um, and 
there are, like I said, differences between West African and East African chimpanzees, the, the best studied subspecies of chimpanzees. And, but I do think, you know, almost everything I study, the savanna environment comes into play. And so one of the reasons I think that the chimpanzees here are so cohesive is that when you have a gigantic home range, you can't hear individuals across the home range like you can in Gombe, Tanzania, where you have a five kilometer home range in one case. Um, that's one of the smallest home ranges, but you can basically hear your, your, your group members across that home range with a loud pant hoot call. At Fungoli, that's just not possible. So you have 10 kilometers in between home range, uh, you know, boundaries. And so keeping together is, uh, you know, one way to basically keep track of your group members, et cetera. So, um, and again, I'm happy to talk more about this, but I want to shift gears a little bit and talk more about the environment and other st and stresses, like I mentioned heat. He is a major stress. And these were the types of questions I was interested in. And, and again, something we've continued to pursue. And it's especially critical now, I believe, with what we see, we definitely see uh, climate change effects at Fungoli. It's been more along the lines of unpredictability of the rainy season. And thus far, what I've seen is that people are, are more adversely affected than the chimps up to this point. And so I think I mentioned that the people that live alongside the chimps at Fungoli practice horticulture. And so what I've seen a couple of years is that you have your rains, you go out and plant at a certain time, and then there's basically a drought for, or there's no rain for several weeks, they have to plant again. And so that's, that's a significant uh, negative effect that we've seen over the past decade or so. But with the chimpanzees, we've not yet been able to measure detrimental effects on their food availability, but we've done some modeling um, about that. But I will, so, but I do wanna say that there are a number of different ways that chimps deal with these stresses that we don't see elsewhere. So one is cave use. And so this is an adult male coming out of a cave and my field assistant um, had first alerted me to this, the fact that he saw chimps coming out of caves and I was like, wow, that sounds amazing. Are you sure? And so we tried to put up camera traps, the chimps were not about it, but once they became habituated, we started being able to observe them come in and out of caves. And then I believe I have a video of a camera trap yeah, set up in the Sokoto cave where the leopard also um, uses the cave. So this is a, a young female lily. And then you have a couple of males just lounging in the cave. I like Luther there, he just sits. Cause he doesn't really matter yet. He's too young <laughs> to be involved in that fracas. So that was basically competition over an estrus female. And these were, all these males were sub-adult at the time, except for Luther was younger. And so he gets to keep his place in the cave. But, um, and, and, uh, and data collection on temperature, the caves are always cooler and they're stable in terms of the temperature there. They're cooler than the outside areas. And so you do have competition besides that competition over an estrus female, you have competition over, um, you know, resting spots in the caves. And these are really more accurately termed rock shelters, but there are a handful of these throughout the home range. And it's also a place that, you know, if we're looking for chimps, we might hit these caves if we haven't found them, if, if for whatever reason the chimps were lost one day, um, which no one wants to have happen because it's very difficult to find them again in a big home range. Um, we'll go to these caves during the dry season. During the rainy season, they get kind of clammy and they don't use them anymore. The temperature difference um, is not, you know, like it is during the dry season when you have these really oppressive periods of heat. But really what limits the chimps at their geographical uh, edge of the range, like in Senegal is water access. So if something happened to these different water sources, the chimps just couldn't survive. They drink daily, especially females with infants. Sometimes males can go a day without drinking, but it's rare. Um, this is the Fungoli Creek bed, in fact, and what you see is that's old female Farafa. She's digging um, a, a well, and this has been seen at other sites, like in Tanzania, it was first described, sorry, Uganda, at a dry, at a, land, a savanna landscape study site as well. And so she digs down to the water table and the water filters up and she drinks it. Um, you probably can't quite tell, but there's an infant next to her and a juvenile. And I feel like that juvenile is perfectly capable of digging his own well, but he doesn't. He waits for his mom to dig it, and then they have to wait for the water to filter up. And this is this gives them access to water during the early part of the dry season, but at the end of the dry season, they no longer can dig far enough down. Um, what's also interesting is at the 
at the beginning of the dry season when the water uh, you know, stops flowing and you see these pools of water, they'll also dig these holes next to stagnant pools. So it seems to have some filter effect. I will say that I ran out of water one time and I drank out of one of these wells and it did not have that effect for me. I was incredibly ill, but I was a little desperate. I learned to take more water with me after that. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is uh, another way that chimps and other animals as well, but chimpanzees and forests don't have to worry about things like water scarcity. Um, this very nice green photo is taken during that really horribly hot time of year in May. So what has happened is you have some initial rains come, the water flows off these open grasslands uh, and they flow into these tiny patches of gallery forest. They fill up the pool. This is a pool where the leopard was and the chimpanzees here during this really hot, humid time soak in these pools of water. So they're in and out, in and out. It's usually a couple of minutes. Um, you have some individuals that really like water. They may be in there for 20 minutes, but you also see competition over access to water. And it may not seem like a big deal, but people that study chimpanzees would think this is perhaps the oddest thing because for a long time we thought chimps were in fact hydrophobic that they were afraid of water because of the way they behave around water at other sites for a human that's incredibly hot it makes perfect sense and i think i've got a video of an alpha male coming in to claim the water hole so you definitely see competition over water um, there's during, right after range, you'll see pools on the further out on the plateau where you don't have vegetation to keep the water from, um, from basically evaporating, et cetera. And I think I've got one video of that. No, I don't, I didn't get a video of that, but you'll see the young individuals have to have to deal with the water out on the plateau, the kitty pools, I call them. This is that same pool and it's uh, from a camera trap. And this is during the night, again, during the hot time of the year before the rains have really kicked in and they'll get chimps make a night nest it's really a leafy bed um, and they'll get up from their night nest go soak in the water for a few minutes get back up and i think it really cools them off with the wind effect and everything so you can see this is adult male kl and jumpkin and there's even a frog there in the foreground for those of you herpetology fans um, this is also too where the leopard walked right by in front of the same camera and nocturnal behavior is something that's not typical of chimpanzees to the extent that you see it at Fongoli. So I think it's an area that we haven't studied much in terms of diurnal primates that are active during the day. You know, we're out with them during the day. Um, they sleep at night, we sleep at night, but there, there's, there's stuff that goes on. Um, with the Fongoli chimps, what we would find is that we'd leave them at a nesting site and then go back to that site in the morning and they had moved significant distances like half a kilometer or something and so I did do a study I spent about 40 nights out with chimps not all in a row but over the course of a year and found that they were indeed active at night um, and so when there was a full moon they were more active uh, when there was an estrus female they were more active and so there was a lot of social behavior but also feeding behavior and again they would sleep during the day for seven hours uh, and then be active at night Um, and so one of the things that we've been working on now, and uh, I had a master's student that looked at heat stress, and I don't know if you can tell, but in the center there, that's actually a chimpanzee moving across uh, a woodland area, or kind of a shrubby area, and so we're looking at basically, we use this heat, in, heat, heat imaging camera to look specifically at the stresses that they deal with in terms of surface temperatures at any rate and the different types of habitats. And of course they, they use the habitats uh, preferentially and there's, there's competition over shade, et cetera. And so when you're an observer out there in April, for example, you don't have access to the good shade. You have to follow the shade of a tree trunk around like all the adolescent males. It was always like me and an adolescent male out there. Um, and so it, it's, it's something else that we're able to do to look more specifically at the heat stress. And we've done some modeling or the student did some modeling um, she's now at Michigan doing her PhD and, you know, basically came up with some estimates about how long the chimps could survive in this type of habitat given climate change scenarios. And so that, that was really useful, not as depressing as I thought it would be, but still a little bit alarming to say the least. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was my nonprofit and we've done a lot of different uh, work with the local community because again, it, without them, we wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have had the project 
at all. Um, and, you know, again, on one level, it, the people in southeastern Senegal here are the reason the chimps are even around when a lot of the larger mammals have gone locally extinct for various reasons. You'll find, you know, these chimpanzees still around, a large bodied mammal. But then also, um, just my project would have never been successful. And in, in this particular image shows uh, Amuli Kamra on the left there in the purple was my first uh, research assistant. He was the head of the village and he was incredibly instrumental to the project. He's the one that told me about the chimps in the caves. He knows the habitat. He's since passed, but he knew the habitat like the back of his hand. He could at night, he had a GPS in his head. He would just go straight. So he was uh, amazing. And, and um, I have a, a relatively small team, you know, that is out with the chimps. So the chimps remain habituated just to us, but we do work with a number of different villages and Fangoli village is just one. These people are Malinke, but we work with Giahanke, um, Pular, Basari, Badik people <clears throat> um, on various projects. So education projects, as well as health related projects, et cetera. And one of the things that we're focused on now is the impact of artisanal mines on not only the chimpanzees, but people's health in this area. And this just shows you the edge of an artisanal mine. And uh, there's always, there's been a long history of gold mining at relatively small levels in the area, but uh, I guess around 2008, we started to see more activity. And um, now we see hundreds of people come into the area, at least in our small area, um, literally thousands and thousands in Senegal itself and, and mining in areas that the chimps use. And we also are looking at the impacts of corporate mines. So there's corporate mines as well. And so I now have students that are looking at, for example, gut microbiomes and looking at how the health of the chimpanzee may be affected by the presence of more humans, humans without access to um, sanitation, that sort of thing. And so that's something that we're looking into water sources, uh, whether or not they're contaminated by things like mercury. And so the impacts or the negative impacts basically are factors that seem to be you know, potentially threatening, threatening the chimpanzees are equally important to the people that live in the area and the people that work at these mines as well. But I think I'm gonna, I think I'm, I'm doing okay on time. I'm okay, I think I'm actually done though. And I will take a lot of questions, of course. And I just wanna thank y'all again for having me. I'm so excited to be in person. Um, uh, and thank you, yeah, for my host, it's, it's been wonderful. So yeah, thank you again. Okay, well, um, thank you, Dr. Preetz. That was, that was wonderful. Those videos are, are quite inspiring um, and a little scary. <laughs> Um, we're uh, happy to take questions. We can take questions from the audience here and also um, online. I will come back and get the questions online. If you're in the audience and have a question, just come on up to the mic up here. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm sorry I missed the beginning of it, um, but I'd like to know a little bit more about the larger like human context that maybe I, I know you touched on it, um, but I'm curious about sort of like the impact of, you mentioned um, local um, practices of, of not eating chimpanzees, and then you mentioned um, processing mines, but I'm curious about um, uh, maybe this speaks to the work in your nonprofit, but about um, conservation efforts. And I know that in other parts of Africa, um, specifically um, uh, in areas where there's been a conflict between wildlife and local residents, um, there's also been the conflict of outside visitors for savanna tourism, whether it's ecotourism that's more conservation or whether it's for gaming. And so I'm curious if you could just comment a little bit more on that context in this region. Yes, I'd love to, thanks. Um, you know, I've, so it is it's definitely a difficult, you know, uh, endeavor, uh, but it, so I, I'll just start with the tourism. So I have actually been approached about doing uh, tourism with chimpanzees and I've always firmly said it is a horrible idea where we are for a number of reasons. And, and the first one for me is that we, the chimps are, live alongside people. Um, if they became completely habituated to humans in general and lose fear of humans, I'm afraid someone would get hurt, uh, human. Um, and the chimps of course would suffer as well, but that 
is something I just couldn't live with. And uh, I have definitely, usually once a year, I'm approached uh, oftentimes by someone in authority about that. I think there are sites in Senegal where you could uh, do that type of program in areas that are protected. Um, you know, I've been approached about protecting the area, but I, I, I don't, I see absolutely greater harm in kicking people out of the area where you've had a system that's worked. Granted, there's changes that have come about that we do need to address, like the artisanal mining. Um, fortunately, I've been really lucky to, to collaborate with a Senegalese primatologist and the most recent PhD there from Dakar got, did his master's at Fongoli and then worked uh, at a nearby site for his PhD. And he's also working with uh, the Fongoli team. He's actually now assistant director of the Fongoli project, Dr. Landing Baji. Um, and he works with the local community, works with us. He works with other chimp uh, sites where you have unhabituated chimps to try to do some, um, uh, I can't think of the name of it, basically zoning, planning to use areas, land use areas. I forget all the names that we use, but so, you know, working, uh, there's no way I could, I could have the same sort of impact that he does. Um, and so that's been really instrumental. But the tourism also for me, I've, you know, I've just asked whenever someone brings it up, I ask for an economic uh, estimate of what type of funds they would bring in. Um, I mean, my nonprofit, I did start not only because it was a personal endeavor, you know, um, it's very easy for me to help people pay for healthcare given the cost of healthcare. And so I did that as part of, you know, my, my project protocol for the people that work for me, but there, you know, as far as like what, what I can have, uh, what I can help with is, is relatively inexpensive costs uh, for, for healthcare there. I'm not saying it very well, but basically, and I have a lot of people that are always interested, students that come out, friends, um, anybody, you know, that, that's it's spent time in Senegal or interested in helping out. And so there's a lot of ways we can do it. So a little goes a long way. So also part of my nonprofit was because I wanted to help give back. I mean, in Senegal, their national motto is Taranga, which means welcoming. So I think even if I was, I don't know, even if they really did hate the idea of what I was doing, they probably would not have said no. It's like, well, okay, you know, and, and then, you know, it's, I have to say, I believe I've had a really good uh, you know, relationship with them. That's our official, you know, that's what we say, you know, every once in a while there's something that happens, but that's just the way it goes um, on the local level. But, you know, it's, it's, to me, it was a way to try to give back as well. Uh, and I, it was not expected, definitely. Again, you know, Taranga, they're very welcoming. And if you want to study the chimps, fine. And yeah, you can go to our sacred water site and sit there and watch the chimps, etc. that sort of thing. So it's, it was really just kind of a no brainer but on a larger level then, so for the community uh, project and, and nonprofit, that to me has been relatively easy if you get past the logistics of nonprofit, IRS, et cetera. But you know, on a, on a different level, that's where something like an ecotourism program comes in. So I understand definitely why people would ask that. Then they see mountain gorillas in Rwanda and look at, look at the success of that. And, but again, in Senegal, I don't think if you look again at the costs and benefits, you know, the, having someone come in, if it's 120 degrees, that is a small group of people <laughs> that are gonna, and then, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're, you may have to go nine kilometers and maybe the chimps won't be there when you get there. So, you know, that sort of, there's definitely a, I think a, a, the tourism base is not what you're gonna see for mountain gorillas in Rwanda, not to take away from the chimps. You definitely would find people that would be interested. Um, but so there's, but again, for me, the risk of overhabituating chimpanzees who would then endanger people, and then that would be the end. Uh, and I just, yeah, I, I can't imagine that scenario. Um, but, you know, one other thing that we're doing is we're working on a national action plan for, for chimpanzees and the uh, Senegalese primatologist is leading that. And, you know, there's been a lot of buy-in. <laughs> I have to say um, that, uh, one, I can't remember which documentary it was, but one of the documentaries on the fun that included Fungoli chimps was seen by a higher up in Senegal and the president actually, president of Senegal sent someone to sit in on our uh, national action plan planning. And so he's been part of that ever since. And so, you know, they, 
I think weren't really, chimps weren't on their radar. I met people in Dakar when I first started and they told me there weren't chimps there. <laughs> I said, there are, <laughs> but you know, now they believe me because I have photos. But at any rate, I, 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 could, I could literally spend hours talking about it, but I, I definitely think that ecotourism Nature tourism is different. Um, you could focus on, you know, the bird life is amazing, even if there's not a huge number of mammals left. And we still see some, some interesting things, but um, there's other things you could do. Another option I've said before is there's a site where chimps use caves at an, uh, where the chimps are unhabituated and you, people can't get there because it's a series of, uh, you know, you'd have to rock climb. And if you would actually rock climb, you're gonna get stung by bees. So the people are, you know, the chimps are basically safe from people there. But, uh, you know, again, it depends on what people want. And the thing that worries me too, is that where the funds would go, you know, would they trickle down to where they're needed? But at any rate, I should stop talking and answer other questions, but it's very interesting. I'd be happy to talk more about it too. We have a couple uh, questions from online. Um, Here's one from Christina. Hi, wonderful talk. Why do you think the males who are not great at modifying tools do not steal tools or take some left from others? Yeah, so that's really interesting. And again, it goes back to the social cohesion and what I call policing in the group. Um, I put it in quotes because I know there's some question as to whether that's too anthropomorphic of a term, but there is intervention when you have <clears throat> specific aggression from like the alpha male stealing something. And regardless whether it's a prey item or a tool, we just don't see a lot of theft. We definitely see typical chimpanzee behavior in other contexts of males uh, displaying and females, you know, uh, giving them a submissive greeting, etc. But when it comes to certain behaviors, you see some different um, different behaviors at fungal So another one we haven't really written up as much, or we've gotten just a couple of anecdotes published so far, but we have a bigger database is that in fact, what you see is that females take tools, not the males. So Tumbo specifically, the alpha female, and this also there's a rank uh, effect. Tumbo and Frafa both are high ranking females. They will approach a male that's termite fishing. And I've literally seen Frafa use her butt to bump him out of the way, take his tool and termite fish. And it's not the way they're supposed to act if they've read anything about chimpanzees. So that is really interesting. And again, you know, we're looking into it. It's, uh, you know, there's uh, what Angie found in her meat sharing study was that reciprocity seemed to explain much of the meat sharing that uh, we recorded, but there's other, you know, there's, there's, it's not the only reason for meat sharing. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, there, there could be some sort of mating strategy perhaps in there that if I let Frafa take my termite mound, maybe she'll mate with me later, et cetera. But we haven't followed those behaviors down the, the road to, to test those hypotheses. Uh, as far as, you know, hunting with tools, I've seen Tumbo take tools from males and take their hunting spot, but I don't see the opposite. Maybe I think David might have done it or what he's done in the past is he's he'll display and then an individual will leave the area and then he'll take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting that male female dynamic and I, but I can't discount the fact that you have so few females and so many males, which is the opposite ratio that you see. And um, you know, that's something that we definitely take into account. And the fact that you have um, so you have a lot of male-male competition over females when you have a female in estrus, because we may have two females in estrus, really, or there are three females in estrus, which at other sites with a lot of females in a bigger group, you're going to have multiple females in estrus, so males maybe wouldn't have the same level of competition. But that's something I'm really interested in. The other thing is we kind of tied into that is, um, again, it comes back to this social cohesion, I think, and then just the social tolerance is what I call it at another level, but they share plant foods like baobab and that one is hard to get into. So there's some effort involved. Um, again, juveniles cannot open their own baobab. So they're dependent on someone, but you see, even when I was there, uh, I was just there in January and I literally saw, I believe, uh, who was it? Dawson, I think, uh, hand a baobab to another adult male. And it's like, what are y'all doing? This is, you're not supposed to do this, right? I mean, not that way, but it's just really interesting uh, to me that sort of active sharing, and that is rare to actively sharing. It's usually more along the lines of begging um, and then getting a share, tolerated scrounging even. But that to me is uh, still a really interesting aspect that we need to pull in plant food sharing because plant food sharing is not often seen with chimpanzees unless it's a specific type of 
plant food. And we do have cases too where um, chimpanzee females will take food from males. And these are foods that they could easily forage for themselves. So it's, it's yeah, it's interesting, but there is some dominance effect. The low ranking females less often. It really depends on the relationship as well. Interesting, thank you. Another question from online from Brianna. Uh, being that this is where humans probably got their start, do you think that since you see females doing a lot of the hunting in these groups, it's possible that human females also contributed more to hunting than previously thought? Would it be a fair assumption that early humans would have shared more behavioral qualities with these chimps since they lived in a similar environment? Yeah, so I mean, one of the reasons I study chimps here is because I, <clears throat> so uh, using primates as models, we, I, so I, I, I feel like I, I have two, uh, two things about my site that I like to stress. And one is that, so I know chimpanzees are studied a lot, but we uh, study them from the basis of homology. So chimps are our closest living relatives in, in addition to bonobos. And evolutionarily, if you're, very, if you're a similar organism, you're expected to exhibit uh, what I call like similar solutions to an evolutionary problem, if you wanna use those terms. And so an evolutionary problem or a stress would be heat. <clears throat> and so my initial thoughts when I first you know, laid out my plans to study here is how do apes respond to these types of stresses? The types of stresses we think early hominins had to deal with heat because in in uh, a Kabali forest in Uganda they have to deal with cold temperatures. They go up to the top of the canopy to sun themselves, and that to me is very odd because you know we don't have to deal with cold temperatures often at fungal. I mean it gets to the 60s, um, and then water. At some sites, chimps don't drink because they get enough water from the fruit they eat. So I was really interested in seeing how our closest living relatives or one of our closest living relatives deal with these same, with these types of problems. And that is at least gives us an idea or a way we can hypothesize about how early hominins may have also dealt with those problems because we just didn't know how great apes behaved in this kind of environment. Um, as far as hunting and things, yeah, I do. I mean, I think there's, it's so, there's so many different levels of the hunting and that's what I found out. So when I first started looking at the hunting behavior, I think our first uh, suggestion as to why females hunt more with males was that at this time of year, <clears throat> uh, you, have, you do have the most cohesive, you, the group is always together. The whole 32 or 36 individuals are together and you would expect more feeding competition at that point. I think I, I brought that in. I no longer consider that to be a really great explanation. Uh, I, I think that it is, it's just nuanced and there's various levels, but I really think the, the nature of the social group. And so, um, you know, that link between tool use, hominin evolution, that type of environment, you know, it's not as, as, as clean as I would have loved it to be, but isn't that the story of our lives as scientists? But the thing is too, I, I do think, and there's been a really great study done fairly recently by Ian Gilby and colleagues that's looked at chimpanzee hunting behavior at other sites as well. And in fact, chimpanzees at Mahali, Tanzania hunt, I think even in one of the papers I published, <clears throat> hunt on average more than the females at Fongoli. Uh, but there's different ways you can look at hunting. Um, but it's not very well studied. So I think one of the things, at least that came out of the Fongoli study is caused people to reconsider female chimps and, uh, and, and basically our questions about hunting in chimpanzees and how it's, it you know, relates to hominin evolution. It's very interesting to me. One aspect that I think is that would inform our understanding of hominins early human evolution is the fact that this type of hunting seen at Fongoli enables a female with a dependent infant to successfully, you know, capture uh, vertebrate prey, so meat. And so um, I think that would be especially valuable. And again, they can run down monkeys, even with babies. I mean, Farafa was, you know, stabbing a leopard, but <clears throat> they're gonna be more efficient without an infant hanging or a juvenile, you know, right behind them crying, et cetera, that type of thing. And so um, this type of hunting is, is something that uh, definitely I know archeologists like Pickering and others have, have um, you know picked up on? Okay, thank you. Um, a somewhat similar question or or um, related uh, from Jennifer. You mentioned uh, different subspecies of chimpanzees. How much of the difference in behaviors do you think are genetically based versus learned? 
I'm wondering what we can glean about the development of human culture from studying chimpanzee behavior over generations. Yeah, I'm not sure about human culture. <laughs> I stay away from humans sometimes, at least living humans, but uh, <laughs> I'll just say that right off the bat. But um, uh, hominid evolution, so I will say that when I say the chimps, I use them as a model to understand humans were probably hominins, so bipedal apes that we wouldn't even consider human, but you know, so hominins that were around about six to seven million years ago, um, because those were hominins that had brains that were about the size of a chimpanzee, a little larger. So that's kind of where I focus, um, you know, my, in terms of, using the, the chimps I study to understand human behavior doesn't mean you can't. I just think we should be very careful with, uh, you know, making analogies between chimpanzees and living humans. Um, <clears throat> can you remind me the rest of that question, Lisa? I kind of just... Uh, the last part of that was, hang on just a minute. I think we humans are last our... part. I just completely forgot. <laughs> Oh yeah, I think you uh, you addressed it um, a little bit. Uh, I'm wondering what we can glean about the development of human culture by studying chimpanzees um, over generations. No, and I, I mean I do think that there's there's aspects uh, of of chimpanzee behavior that can help us understand, you know, behavioral changes. Oh, learning. So I think genetics they brought in that too with the subspecies. Okay, so that's also yeah. I do think that there are. Uh, differences between subspecies based on what we've presented so far. But the thing is, again, if you look at, remember back to that map, you have three long-term studies in West Africa and Uganda, there's seven. Uganda, just the one country. Um, and so you have so much more on the Schweinfurthii is the subspecies in Uganda. And there was a paper, I will say I was part of it, but it was a paper on aggression in chimpanzees, lethal aggression, um, which is something you see in East Africa more significantly more than in West Africa. And, and the difference you did see uh, between lethal aggression was, I guess, bonobos and West African chimps were significantly different from the East African chimps was the only other subspecies we really had a great sample size for. I think there was the one, um, Sands Morgan study in Central Africa. But so there are some significant differences. And then another thing is just the nature of the social community. And so in uh, Ivory Coast for a long time, they've presented data that shows rather than having say what has been called, uh, you know, nursery uh, subgroups of females and their offspring and then all males together, you see more what they call bisexually bonded. So males and females within a social, within a party. So you have your social group, then you have subgroups or parties. And like I said, in Fungola, you often have all the social group together at one time and you do have subgroups. And it's similar to what we see elsewhere in West Africa where you have males and females together rather than just males and just females kind of being more separate. And so that seems to be a West African trait as well. And what I, the way I like to, to look at it is uh, I get, I get a little, uh, sensitive about, you know, I don't, if, if you're on, if you know what a bonobo is, it's the sister species to chimpanzees. And a lot of times we offset chimps and bonobos. So chimps are the aggressive, uh, ape and then bonobos are the hippie ape. Right. And to some degree they're, they're, they may be right, but it's also a continuum of behavior. If you look at the subspecies and so West African chimps, if you put them on a on a graph, they would not be, you know, incredibly close to bonobos, but they're more bonobo-like in some aspects of their behavior, like lethal aggression. There's just very little lethal aggression between chimpanzee groups. Um, but yeah, no, I think there are uh, there are subspecies differences, and now we're we're starting to tease out some. By and large, they're more similar than different. But I think the differences are, you know, as anthropologists think, that's always what's interesting is to look at the differences and try to figure out why. And so I do think on, on one level, it is it is genetic. And um, so, you know, it appears that the East African subspecies is further derived uh, according to some of those behaviors like lethal aggression, which we rarely see in West Africa. Thank you. Another question. I know that chimps can drown easily in very little water due to their muscle fat ratio. Have you ever witnessed that over the years when using the pools? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so the pools are shallow. That one pool that I showed multiple times, it only comes up to like my knees because the film crew made me get in there one time. <clears throat> but um, 
it's but it's interesting so it's not over the head of a chimpanzee it might be if they're quadrupedal kind of you know right there but they are very careful about getting in so i don't know if you remember there's like vines that come down they're very careful about holding on to the vines it's like getting into the pool and hanging on to something like the side and now i will have to say the alpha male broke one of the major vines last year and so the vine is no longer there he ruined it for everybody so when they get in they're very careful about like using their hands on the side to sit down very slowly so they are very careful and they may some of them may get up to their neck but usually it's just kind of up to their waist and i've never seen a chimp put their head underwater. Um, and so, yeah, they're very careful. What's also interesting to me is that at the Gambia River, which is a river that has a really steep bank, um, we don't see any soaking behavior. And in part, that's probably because there's crocodiles there. Um, I've only seen one juvenile uh, soak in the water there and he hung onto a vine, but that's probably because of crocodiles. But I, I also it could be because of the depth and there are, only I think small crocodiles there now. There's also hippos, which they're terrified by. But um, yeah, it is interesting. They do not soak at all in that river where they could drown. They'll um, cross the streams and they'll soak in the streams as well, but never go into really deep areas. They use the same sites year after year. Thank you. We have one last question from online. Why is it that there are certain areas of Africa the chimps are less studied. Is it restricted by government, Government harder to get permission, or just hasn't really been thought of? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, it's kind of hard to say. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's, I know there, there's, there's country by country, you know, uh, challenges, I imagine. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, in, in part, I'm sure access, uh, you know, um, I imagine Tanzania for Jane Goodall. Uh, you know, Louis Leakey was instrumental in that. It was uh, the various colonizers um, probably have some influence on who then studies there, et cetera, the history, the language, things like that. I will say I am poor at languages and I regret it constantly. I just am poor. Uh, so my French is very elementary. I can limp along with Malinky and at least understand a few words, right? But <clears throat> um, so, you know, I oftentimes I visit Uganda. It's beautiful. I love Uganda, but I'm very jealous when I hear people speaking English. I don't know if that's, you know, a prime mover for choice of, you know, where the, you know, primatologist would choose to work, et cetera. It wasn't for me. I mean, maybe I should have been smart and gone somewhere else where I could speak, you know, better. Uh, but, you know, for me, it was a savanna environment. And again, like in Senegal, there had been a study in the 1970s and they abandoned that uh, after four years because they didn't think the chimps could be habituated. And so that was actually my postdoc advisor that led that. And I started there because that had a history of, of Savannah chimpanzee studies, or at least an attempt. And there's also other sites. Now there's another, there's a site in Tanzania, Isa, where the chimps were habituated. So we have a second Savannah site. And so we can start to see uh, more and, and, you know, examine Fongoli in that light. But yeah, it's interesting. I, I also think that um, probably the history of, of uh, environmental studies, et cetera, that must have some something to do with it. Um, I, I know that some friends have told me that in certain countries you have pretty exorbitant fees, not very many, but um, I probably shouldn't say this, but I do. I've actually told some officials in Senegal they should ask for more, you know, from a, an established researcher, maybe not, you know, not someone that's just starting out or what have you, but, um, and we work, we do other things. We fund students from their um, organization. So we do it that way. But uh, yeah, I imagine there's a number of different things. Um, and other places, oh, definitely there's been, and the DR Congo, uh, you know, there was a time when primatologists just had to leave their study site. So there was a big gap in the study of bonobos because it was unsafe to be there. Um, and so you, you know, knock on wood, I've never had that happen, but yeah, political uh, reasons as well. Um, yeah. I have a question if there's no other questions in the, in the audience. Um, um, yesterday in the student session, you mentioned that you work to habituate the males. Um, in the group, but not so much the females. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why would, why would you avoid habituating the female chimps? 
Right. So when I first started uh, at the Fungoli site, I was interested in female behavior. That's what I did my dissertation on. <clears throat> and so I was interested in pursuing that same questions. And they would, most people would think they're super boring. It had to do with food availability and then social behavior, et cetera. But uh, I was really interested in it. But what I come to find out when I started working with the people in Senegal, and I will say that I, I didn't move out to Fungoli right away. Um, I tried to kind of ease my way into the community. And I, I did, I still had other sites, I would go visit that sort of thing. And so I felt like I learned quite a bit about it. I was very conservative in my habituation protocol. So for example, we wouldn't try to follow the chimps up until nesting time, because I just didn't know how stressed they were. It seems like they're doing fine, you know, so far with the heat and living around humans, et cetera. But I had no idea they hadn't been studying this type of environment. So I was very conservative, but I had also heard, I mean, you know, one of the first things of course that I um, found out, <laughs> excuse me, found out was that there's a taboo against uh, eating or harming chimpanzees. And I did have a student actually the next year come and do her uh, thesis. She was a cultural anthropologist and do her thesis on that, interviewed a lot of people from different groups in the area. So that was wonderful. Uh, I just didn't know. And, but then I did hear that in rare cases, <clears throat> people would take advantage of seeing a female chimp with a baby to try to get that baby to sell, even though that was a rarity, it was economically incentive enough. Um, and so I made the decision not to follow female chimpanzees as focal subjects. So the way our protocol is, we have one male subject a day and um, the, routine, it, the schedule depends on who we've recently observed. So we'll have like uh, Dawson or somebody, <clears throat> if I can find Dawson, if I know where he slept, et cetera, if I can keep up with him, that's fine. And then we may switch, but that male knows we're following him. And we keep about 30 feet, that's our protocol distance of so 10 meters. And we can, cause we can see very well in that habitat, but he knows we're following him. The females are okay if you're in a group with a male and you're not focused on them, but you really try not to even look hard at females. Some of them will come way too close. Like Nickel, she's been with us. She never left her social group. Sometimes she'll bring her baby really close. Even Tumbo, it annoys me. Cause then I, uh, I worried about it, you know, for disease transmission, I need to get away, but you know, they are fine when they're in that group, but I've encountered them <clears throat> by themselves. And what I want to do, I won't follow them, but I'll just make sure I get a count, make sure I can see they have any wounds or what their estrus state is and they are nervous when it's just them by themselves or even a group of a couple of females but that's the way i want them to be so it's worked out i have been criticized for it i don't care uh because it's worked out and i don't want to put them in more jeopardy than they are because you definitely do change their behavior we don't know how all it changes but you know i don't want them to get too relaxed and they're not the males are relaxed but even so like i was there in january uh you know, there was a group of men that came to cut some trees from a nearby gold mine and the chimps were warning barking, warning barking and things like that. And they were, you know, ready to, to run off if the men came close and the men saw me and then they're like, oh, there's a, there's a woman out there. And then they left. I don't know what they thought, but at any rate, um, yeah, so I, I haven't studied chim uh, females in that way. The thing is we can get a lot of information on the females. So if we hear somebody hunting, we go in that direction. We just don't keep following her. Um, and, and I will say when chimps hunt and they capture something, they're vigilant anyway. It's almost as if you're going to also take that. And I've never tried to take meat from anybody, but it's like, you know, turning your back and things like that. But yeah, I, I, uh, just didn't want to make them more susceptible, but we did have one case in 2009, in 2009, where, uh, hunters, uh, these young men got a baby chimp from our group, but just somehow it all worked out to where my project manager was able to confiscate that baby. I flew back over. We found the mom. We didn't even know which baby it was. <clears throat> and the group took her back and it was fine, but that's miraculous. We didn't find any other case with chimps of that happening. Cause usually the mother is killed, but she was injured um, and wasn't able to keep up with the group, but an adolescent male carried the baby for her. It was just like, yeah, this, everything fell into place. But so, you know, once in 21 years, even with our group that we, you know, we try to be with the chimps daily, that, that kind of thing happened one day when we weren't there. Um, but yeah, that was a really long answer, but yeah, I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's definitely, yeah, I would love to know more about female behavior, especially when they're not around males, but it's just not something I'm willing to do. It's, it's really for their own protection, essentially. Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. 
Are there any other questions from online or the audience? Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, Preetz. Thank you all again.